I want to go back in time, and we're going to talk about the church in Corinth, and uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, we'll talk about that title in a few minutes, but um, we're going to spend a few Sundays in, in Corinth, and uh, we actually have uh, two Corinthians right here with us. Ken and Cheryl just got back from Corinth a few weeks ago, right, Ken? Yeah, that's what you told me in the parking lot, so, uh, but what we say today doesn't apply to them, that was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> So, um, first of all, though, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Facebook. Uh, I don't know how many of you use Facebook. I didn't use it at all until about two years ago, and uh, I discovered uh, Judy's Facebook account. And so this is her homepage, and uh, I needed a way to communicate with doctors and stuff over in Cambodia across the time zone, and I discovered Messenger, and that worked really great. So I started using it. And then people kind of discuss, you know, I gave people my, my uh, tell them to look up my wife, and she went from, uh, she's now got about 500 friends, most of whom are Cambodian. <laughs> so, um, but anyhow, uh, I noticed one thing about Facebook is I kind of check people's sites and stuff. You always put up good pictures of yourself, right? And I mean, that's a pretty nice picture of us. And Judy, you made me take off my glasses so I look better. So, <laughs> so I kind of learning this whole thing. It's kind of new to me. But, so, what pictures to put up? I haven't started posting any yet, but I'm trying, trying to get the feel of it so you guys can help me. Now, I would say that's a keeper. That's a picture that you could post on Facebook, right? Thumbs up on that one. What about this one? Uh, just after cataract surgery, I don't think so. We'll give that one a thumbs down, all right? <laughs> so, uh, give me some help on another one. Now, that one, that, that looks like a real pasture, right? Boy, I, I must be... I mean, I'm all ready to sprout wings and fly off to heaven or something. <laughs> so, I didn't take that guy at one of our conferences. I don't know how he got that expression, but anyhow. So that one would be a keeper. What about this one? A crazy bicyclist with helmet hair. I don't think so. Let's uh, forget that one. <laughs> so, um, ah, here's my church family. What a sweet mother and son, right? That picture, keeper? Yeah, I'd say that's a keeper, Rebecca and Andrew. What about that one? I don't think so. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, in Facebook, I, you know, the thing is you put up positive pictures about yourself. Uh, if we put up our actual, our, our, our both sides, of the good times, the bad, I don't think anybody would want to look at our Facebook page because they'd get depressed. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, the, um, when you come to the, the Word of God, it's a bit different. You know, God has different goals. And for the Lord, He presents everything. And when we get to Corinthians, we find a real-life picture of a first-century church. Both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And of course, this comes from uh, Clint Eastwood's film with the same title. But God, the Lord is brutally honest. He just records everything. And his goal, of course, is to, is, you know, we can learn from both the good things and the bad, from the mistakes and the successes, the victories and the defeats. The Lord records everything in his word. There's no cover-ups. Um, there's no, um, uh, everything's just kind of laid out by the Lord for us to see. And it's, it's all of value. And uh, so let's start with, uh, well, Paul himself, he, he starts his letter with these words, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Sosthenes was his scribe, he wrote down the letter for him. Uh, but Paul, as an apostle, he's the one who planted the church in Corinth. He lived there for 18 months. When he originally started the church, he stayed in their houses. He went through some difficult trials with them. Uh, he knew them, he knew, knew who they were, he wasn't just a visitor. He had become their spiritual father. He loved them and he cared for them. And so when he writes his letter, he's not writing it with, a, with the idea that we're gonna, this is going to become part of the Bible and we're going to see it. He's just writing down a letter, desperately trying to straighten out some problems in the church because this church had major problems. In fact, it had so many problems that, um, you know, I kind of think for myself, if I'd been the Lord, I kind of would have gotten these letters that he wrote lost. <laughs> it looks pretty bad. Um, but Paul writes about these things and he, he dives in and deals with some really serious problems uh, in the church. 
So just a quick summary of, of what's in this letter. And uh, it's almost, uh, uh, from my, my point of view, this, this letter is um, probably it reveals that the Church of Corinth is probably the church that was hurting the most in the entire New Testament, in my uh, point of view. By the way, does everybody have a copy of the notes? Uh, everybody got that? If you don't, lift your hand up real quick. We've still got plenty. I mean, if you have the notes, they're pretty complete. Oh, we've got two. Um, Paul or somebody who has the notes. Uh, they're back on the table. Yep, they're back on the table. We've got them coming around. So if you've got the notes, they're so complete, you could probably just leave right now and just read the notes. You'd be okay. Don't do that, though. <laughs> so so uh, just kind of going through a litany of problems that Paul had to deal with and that we'll encounter in this letter. First of all, right in verse 10, right off out of the gate, he had factions and divisions within the church. These guys were fighting with each other. And that's not too good for the church of God. Um, you had really unspiritual attitudes. You had competition. You had gossip. You had slander. I mean, Paul, in his second letter, he said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to any accusation unless there's two or three witnesses. And now, uh, you had envy, a lot of bad stuff. You had spiritual pride and boasting. I mean, Paul got pretty frustrated at times. He said, do you guys think the gospel came from you? You know? Uh, you had um, gross sexual immorality. A man had taken his father's wife, his stepmother, married his stepmother, was living with her. We don't know. This would have been shocking to the non-Christians in, in, in pagan Corinth society. This would have shocked them. So this is pretty bad stuff. Um, cheating one another in financial matters. Lawsuits. They were taking each other to court. I mean, uh, that's certainly not something we want to yeah, publicize. Uh, and they were falling back in old sinful habits and practices. Idolatry. Huge pagan temples. That, that, you know, Corinth was a city that had uh, uh, quite a, a Gentile population, a Jewish population, but a large Gentile population in which these pagan temples. And I was reading in one article that one of them had over a thousand priestesses who all functioned as prostitutes. So this was, again, really kind of off the charts. Class resentments. Uh, between the rich and the poor, and really the rich looking down on the poor, very much a reflection of, of a Roman society at the time, but shouldn't have been seen in the church. And finally, you even have drunkenness during communion. You know, the rich were so eager to get their share of the wine they provided, they drank so much they got drunk. So, and these are this level of problems that I think, uh, boy, uh, I look at that and uh, I, I think any church looks good in comparison to Corinth. <laughs> To tell you the truth. So um, that's the bad and the ugly. Now the interesting thing about this is that if you read Paul's letter, uh, this is all later on in the letter. But he begins with very positive things. And um, he, um, Church of Corinth had more problems by far than any church in the New Testament. In fact, they almost made any church look good by comparison. Despite all this, Paul begins his letter with very positive words reminding them of who they were in Christ and of all he had done for them. In other words, the good. So Paul begins his letter by focusing on the good of the church. And if you look at Paul's letters, almost every one of them is like that. So Paul did not see them in their failure and their sinfulness and their mistakes and so on. He saw them as who they were in Christ. He saw them as Jesus saw them. And, you know, I find this directly applicable to our lives. As a lot of times in my own life, I'm sure in your life, we see our shortcomings, our failures. That's kind of what we focus on. But the Lord, he sees us differently. And you get this right up in verse 2. It starts right out. He addresses them to the church of God, which is a court. He doesn't say to the failed church of God, to the marginal church of God. Uh, you know, uh, he says to the church of God in court. They are to God's chosen representative in this city for the good or for the bad. God is not ashamed of them. Some of their actions shame him. But the Lord himself is not ashamed of them. He calls them his chosen church. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now that word sanctified, um, that, that speaks of the fact that in Jesus, who died 2,000 years ago for all of our sins, that every single sin that they had was forgiven. That they were cleansed from sin in God's sight. 
that they were clothed in Jesus' perfect righteousness despite all the failures in their lives. And that his righteousness covered their sinfulness. In a sense, Paul chose to see them as the Lord saw them. When the Lord looks at you and I, he sees Jesus' righteousness. He's well aware. He's a realist. He's well aware of our failures and sinful nature. But when he looks at us, he sees the good. You know, you read on in that same verse, saints by calling. Well, reading through that litany of problems, it doesn't, they don't sound very much like saints, like holy ones. But Paul addresses them. You are God's holy ones. God has called you. With all those who in every name call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. He calls us that too. We don't look like saints sometimes, but that's what he considers us. That's what he calls us. I think of God's calling us, and he's called all of us, just like he called the Corinthians. He's called us out of darkness into light. He's called us out of shame into glory. He's called us out of weakness into power. He's called us out of slavery into freedom. He's called us out of being spiritual orphans into being children of God. He's called us out of being prisoners of Satan. Paul writes in another place, being held captive by him to do his will into being citizens of heaven. That's who we are. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's what Paul saw. That's what Jesus saw when he looked at Corinth. That was the primary thing that he saw. That was the choice Paul made. He chose them to see them as Christ saw, saw them. Now, I thought about this, and I thought, well, how do I see myself? How do we see ourselves? We have to make a choice to do this, because Satan's the accuser. He's always reminding us of our weakness. He's always reminding us of our failures. For myself, I have to choose to see myself as Jesus, Jesus sees me. I have to choose to put on his righteousness by faith. And um, how do I view others? How do we view others? How do we view... Uh, others in our church, others in our family. And we all have difficulties and conflicts. But do we choose to see each other as who we are in Christ or who we are in kind of our own sinful nature? I think of the Corinthians. They came out of a society that was incredibly corrupt, even by any standard, uh, where there was tremendous greed, tremendous social oppression, social injustice, ethnic hatreds, uh, Immorality, uh, prostitution is part of their religion. It just goes on and on and on. And you know, coming into coming into the kingdom of God from this environment, there had to be kind of a lot of smoke stains in their clothes. And I remember when our son Tony arrived from Cambodia, fresh out of the refugee camps, we received him at, at uh, we met him at San Francisco Airport. He gets off the 747. And, uh, and from the camp, from the refugee camps in Thailand, he smelled like smoke and he smelled like gold. <laughs> you know? And uh, yet, uh, so, you know, I, I think we come with the, the scent of the world sometimes around us, left over. Certainly they have. But God sees us, not as what he called us out of, but as what he's, he's, he's taken us into. That's who he sees us as. Um, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's a great verse. Paul's going to have to write some pretty hard words to them. We, you go into, from chapter 10 on, he's dealing with some pretty serious issues. He has to give them some pretty serious discipline. And, um, but you know what? Every word he spoke, he wrote in this letter, every word he, he, he spoke to them was meant to build them up. Now, you and I, we need discipline at times. And as a father disciplines his children, the Lord disciplines us. Sometimes we need to hear hard things. But you know what? Every word that the Lord speaks to us is always meant to build us up. We're targets of God's grace. We're targets of his peace. That's his goal for us. We're not targets of his judgment. Now, Satan wants to, us to forget that. He wants us to think of God as judge, of God waiting to kind of uh, uh, come down on us because we deserve it, and we do. But that's not what he has for us. His words to us are always grace and peace. They may be hard to, to, to listen to at times. And um, my own life, 
My wife, a lot of times, the Lord uses her to speak some hard things to me. Um, and you know what? That hurts a bit. But I'm always thankful for it because they, you know, I know she's right. And I know the Lord's speaking through her to me. And I listen to those things. We've got to hear them. But don't forget, you are targets of God's grace and peace. You know, in saying that, I, I have to look at myself. You know, as a pastor, I talk to people. Sometimes I get frustrated. I get frustrated with problems and sin in people's lives and things like that. And I always have to ask myself, God extends grace and peace to me. Am I extending that to the people in my church? And I think we all have to, to, to look at that. When, people, when I talk to people, even when I have to talk to them about difficult things, are they receiving difficult words, but are they receiving God's grace and peace? Because they should be. Or do I have a judgmental spirit? And that, to me, that's always a constant thing I have to watch for in, in my own life. Paul goes on, and he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. They were causing him lots of problems. As far as we can tell from the letter, he wrote several other letters, at least one more, besides 1st and 2nd Corinthians, perhaps two. He made multiple visits to Corinth. There's some mentioned in this letter that there's some speculation that he made other visits that weren't very successful, or perhaps Timothy did in his place. And you read through both of these letters, and especially 2nd Corinthians, Paul had a lot of heartache. And this was a problem church. And, uh, and yet he writes these words, I thank my God always concerning you. Paul thanked the Lord for them, even though they were a source of heartache, because he saw God's grace working in their lives. He wasn't about to give up on them because the Lord never gives up on us or on anyone. And, uh, and he begins at this point to, to begin to remind them of all the, the, how God's grace had worked in their life. And I know myself, and I'm sure you too, we need to every now and then remind ourselves of the grace we've already received, how grace has worked in our life, and how it's changed us so far. Um, Paul thinks back on when they came to Christ. He was the one who planted the church, led them to the Lord. Um, that in everything, you were enriched in him, in all speech, and in all knowledge. Now, all speech, I can imagine what... Before they were saved, before they knew Jesus, what the conversation was like. Filled with it, a, a city filled with quite a few people, many tens of thousands, if not far more. Different ethnic groups that didn't like each other very much. You could imagine the level of animosity and ethnic hatreds and so on. He had a society that was, had a very rich, a very small percentage of rich to talk. Then you, you, you had the free people below that, but they were all impoverished. impoverished and you didn't really have a middle class, and then you had the slaves. They were kind of on the bottom, but at least they got food and stuff every day. It was a very, there was a lot of, you know, the upper class looked down on everybody else. The lower class uh, hated the upper class, but they had too much power, they were afraid. You could imagine what people's speech was like. Of course, jesting, Paul writes about that in some of his letters. The kind of immorality that happened in Corinth, I couldn't imagine what, uh, what the guys talked about. Um, and yet he said, you were enriched in him in all speech. Their language changed. They went from cursing to blessing. They went from complaining to praise. They went from negative to positive. You know, you think of if our words defined us, the Holy Spirit transformed the Corinthian speech. It became completely different. In all knowledge, you know, before we come to Jesus, before they came to Jesus, doesn't the gospel, the word of God makes absolutely no sense. But when we receive Jesus, his spirit comes to dwell in us, and suddenly we can understand the things of God. Paul watched this transition in their lives. He saw this happen. They came, they received Christ, and suddenly they began to understand the word. They began to understand his preaching like they never had before. That's the grace of God in our lives. Paul saw tremendous transformation. That in everything you were, oh, let's see, that didn't change. Whoops. Even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. The thousands of people, hundreds of people, maybe thousands, came to the Lord in Corinth. Great miracles happened. People were healed. Demons were cast out. Uh, this was a really miraculous situation. And they saw that. It affected their life. God began to do miracles in their lives. Uh, provide for them. Heal marriages. 
and they saw this. And then I'm sure that the testimony was also confirmed, as it is in all of our lives, as we begin to change. And our speech begins to change. We don't lose our anger as much. We start changing inner, inwardly. And it's not maybe noticed so much by us as it's noticed by our family. It's noticed, noticed by our husband or our wife. It's noted by our coworkers. You know, they begin to see a change in us. The testimony of Jesus is confirmed. This is not just belief. This is something that's powerful for changing our lives for the better. So Paul reminds them that the message of the gospel came with power. It changed your lives. It changed your community. You experienced God's power. And you still are. So that you are not lacking in any gift awaiting eagerly the resurrection, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, he reminds them that God had given them everything that they needed to serve the Lord and to know Him. The gifts of the Spirit, we'll read about those in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts and callings of the Holy Spirit, very much present in the church of Corinth. As a church, as individuals, God had given them all things. They were complete in Christ. In the same fashion, you and I, God has gifted us, gifted us individually. He's gifted our church. We're complete in Him. You know, we have everything because it's all freely given to us in Christ. All things belong to us. We are complete in Christ. That is a wonderful encouragement, isn't it? Wow. How could, you now this brings to a question. We start out and we list all their litany of problems, which are pretty bad, it makes you kind of shake your head. And then we read about how God saw them, how Paul saw, saw them, about the grace of God in their lives. How could Paul have such confidence in such a weak church? In a sense, how could he resolve this contradiction between the way they were acting in some sense, the situation, circumstances, and who they were in Jesus? Um, that's sometimes hard to resolve. Sometimes in our own lives, it's hard to resolve. Uh, we look at sometimes the way we act in some situations and we think, boy, what's wrong with me? Well, how could Paul speak with such confidence about them? His confidence was in the Lord. That was the whole reason. And he writes about that in 8 and 9. And this weak church, this struggling church, this church that was fighting with each other, this church that was falling back into sins that are just really obvious, Paul writes this about it, referring to Jesus. He will confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He saw them through the eyes of God. He's, the Lord knew their weaknesses, but the Lord also knew his plans for them, his intentions for them, and because God is God, these are going to happen. They may take it, may time, but they are absolutely going to happen by His power. Now, in my own ministry, uh, there's been times when I've given up on people in a sense, at least in some areas of their lives. I had a church member once who swore to me that they would never, ever forgive another person in the church. And I just kind of shook my head. I said, you have to do that. That's what the Lord tells us. We have to forgive one another. And this person said they absolutely do Two to three years later, the Lord dealt with this person in their life. They had a number of things happen, but the um, person had some serious health issues, uh, passed out a number of times, had heart attacks, multiple heart, heart attacks in ICU. She woke up from that uh, heart attack, and um, her first words was that she wanted to meet with this person and reconcile with them and forgive them. I heard that. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was the greatest miracle I'd ever seen. I said to Judy, you know what? This is never going to get resolved this side of heaven. Well, you know what? It got, it got resolved this side of heaven. I was proven wrong, and I was really glad about that. Don't underestimate God's power in your life, in your children's lives, in your husband or wife's lives. Um, don't underestimate God's power. God can do beyond. In our own lives, he can change us in ways that are simply not possible because he's God. He will confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was a stretch for the church in Corinth. That's a stretch for us. But that's God's word, based on who he is, not who we are. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, 
Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. That's the whole point. There are times I'm faithless. There's times that I just fall flat on my face. I'm sure you have those times too. But you know what? We get real discouraged. Don't we? Because the one we put our trust in, our hope in, he is always faithful. He's going to make it happen. We can trust him to complete the good work he began in us. Right? Amen. Amen. Some points. Don't look back on who you were. This is our natural tendency. And of course, this is what Satan wants us to do. He wants to have us, our eyes focused on the rearview mirror. And he reminds us constantly. Well, you know what happens when you drive focused on the rearview mirror, right? <laughs> You're going to hit something. In contrast to that, Paul could write this confidently because he was writing from the Lord's perspective. Look forward to who you are becoming. That's what Jesus sees when he looks at us. He sees his intentions for us. He sees his plan for us. He sees us as who he's guaranteed to make us transform us into. Never lose hope for yourself. Again, because it's God who's doing it. For your marriage. One of the big points that Paul makes in, in his, his whole chapter on marriage in chapter 7 is to stay together. Even when you're, you've, you're married to a, a pagan, non-Christian husband who's still going to the temples, and etc. You know, things that were intolerable. Don't lose hope. God is still working in your unsaved husband's or wife's life. You know, don't give up on each other. Don't give up on your family. I think so often our kids go through difficult transitions to adulthood. and They can be raised in the church and experience the Lord's grace and then fall away for a period. I did that uh, in my college years. But you know what? The Lord brought me back. And he's working in our children's life even when we can't seem to get through to them. Don't give up on your church members, on your fellow, your fellow believers. Don't give up on one another because the Lord is working in all of our lives and he is transforming us because our confidence is not in man, but it's in God. Amen. That's where our confidence comes from. Well, choose to see yourself and others as God sees you, as holy ones forgiven, made clean and sanctified in Christ, clothed in his righteousness and not your own. That's how Paul saw the Corinthians. That's how Jesus saw them. That's how he sees you and I, no matter where we are. Mount Hood. Uh, some of you will recognize it's got kind of a distinctive profile if you look directly that way and out in the parking lot. You'll see Mount Hood in the distance. It's about 2,700 feet in elevation. It's right opposite Oakmont. It's a great, there's a park there. It's a regional park. It's a great place. So if you ever get a chance, go up there and go hiking. So uh, Saturday, I went up there with uh, Pastor Billy from the, the bridge, you know, our uh, uh, fellow believers. Now, Billy and I got together, and we headed up there and made it to the top, all right? So um, the back side, the north side of Mount Hood, which is, we went in over Los Alamos Road, which is the, the north entrance, drive down to Santa Rosa Creek headwaters, and then hike up from there. And so we came in from the north side, and that wasn't touched by the fires. It's all green, just like, this was actually, the picture was taken at the summit. And so you can see there's nice green trees behind us. The fire didn't touch most of that area. Um, but the south side, as you see from Oakmont, uh, Pythian Road, that's been torched. Now, I don't know if you got, that didn't turn out too good. If you can, you can't see that too well, I'm sorry about that. But what that is, you get up and look down the south side, and it's this Manzanita forest that's totally, completely torched. <laughs> I mean, everything's burnt. It's just a wasteland. It's almost like volcanic. Um, but you can't see this picture, but if you look carefully, you'll see a few things of green. So I took a picture a little bit further away, the same torch manzanita forest, but you can really see the green coming through here. New life is coming up. Now, our lives, we come to Christ, and Satan's damaged us. Sin has damaged us. There's a lot of, in some ways, their life is burnt manzanita forest. But God doesn't see that. And we shouldn't see that either. Instead, what he's focused on is the new life that he's bringing about in our lives. And it's coming up. It's coming up just like this new greenery is coming up, these little plants. It was just beautiful up there to see this happen. It's healing itself by, in a natural sort of way. 
You and I, when we come to Christ, it becomes natural for us to be renewed, to be healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's who the Corinthians were. They were new creatures in Christ. Sure, there were still some burnt, some burnt branches there. There was still some smoke damage. But what Paul saw was all that green new growth, and it was beautiful. That's who you and I are. Sure, we've got some fire damage, but new growth has happened. We are new creatures in Christ, and he is renewing us every single day, whether we're aware of it, whether we can see it or not. Isn't that great, guys? Yes. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's thank the Lord. Lord Jesus, we just come to you, and uh, we're so thankful for Paul, and that you used him, and that he saw the way you saw, he understood, he thought the way you thought. And Lord, we just thank you for his, the graciousness you extended to the Corinthian church uh, through Paul, and how we see your grace and your mercy, and not only to them, but to all our all, to us also. Lord, we thank you that, that the old creature, the person we used to be, the damage, that's passed away. It's as good as gone. We are new creatures in Christ. You have done, begun a work in us that will not stop. And you will complete it because you are faithful. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.